So our God is faithful yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen? Amen. Okay, good. This is what we've been digging into in this Lenten season. It's what Hank kind of laid the foundation for over last week. God is faithful to those He's bonded Himself to in covenantal relationship. We looked at that last week as we dug into the prophecies and the promises of our God and the fulfillment we see throughout Scripture routinely over and over again, His faithfulness to us. The Bible is a library. That's where it got its name, Bible. Library of 66 different books written over the course of centuries, and yet it's one unified story. 66 books written over centuries, various authors, different time periods, different forms, poetry, communi- or, sorry, poetry, uh, philosophy, historical records, genealogy, and yet it's all unified in Christ. Now, I love a good story. Story is what drives us forward. Story turns the wheels of time forward. It's what moves us. It's what gets us up every day. Because every day you wake up and there's a little narrative in your head, right? Nod, even if there isn't. So I'm not alone. There's a voice that like narrates your day as you go, yeah? And you kind of play out the character of the day. And as you go forward, it just kind of keeps pushing you and pushing you. So the question is, is what makes a good story? What makes a story withstand the test of time? What makes a story relevant and able to be connected with? Well, every good story logically follows the hero's journey. We have a slide. How many of you are familiar with this? Raise your hand. Yeah? Okay. English class, right? Yes, thank you. No one else gets it. Okay. The hero's journey is a narrative device that was formulated by Joseph Campbell. He was a philosopher and writer, and he wanted to know what made stories withstand time. Why do stories last? You have stories that were told back centuries ago that are still relevant today that are continuing to be retold because we connect with them. So what is it? Why, why do we have these stories? Well, Joseph Campbell identified these main things that come together in a story that every protagonist kind of follows. Talking about the hero's journey, Campbell says a hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there, and he encounters, and a device of victory is won, and the hero comes back with this myster- from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons upon his fellow man. This is a narrative device that we're quick to attach ourselves to. Now, you're never going to be able to watch a movie the same because they all follow this circle. You don't have to think too long and too hard about your own life if we can put the the journey back up to take bits and pieces and see where your story fits on there. There's some type of normal that you're a part of. At some point, something changed. Something pushed you into this world of unknown and you experienced challenges because now you're in this space that doesn't belong to you, that you're not comfortable in. You hit this rock bottom moment. We've all had one. If you haven't, get ready, it's coming. And then we return out of it, right? Because we, we, we make it through it. We come back and at some point, we recognize we're back where we kind of belonged, but we're different now. We're a consequence of our circumstances, we've changed. We know more, we have more, we've developed, we've grown, we've matured. Something has changed and we're now able to spread that and share it with those who are back in our comfortable known, those who didn't get to go on the journey with us. The Bible is a unified story. It leads to Jesus. It's a library of books, different genres, genealogies, philosophical expressions, historical accounts, prophetic revelations, and it's this vast amalgamation of different documents, and yet it all comes together to be the greatest story that's ever been told. The prophecies and promises of God were written as an anchor point for God's people. They serve as a revelation to the nations, The Scripture communicates first to the nation of Israel and then to the rest of us, to the world, whose we are, who we are, and where it is we're going. 
Psalm 8 reads, O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars you've set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. And yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, and everything that swims the ocean currents. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. The prophecies within Scripture, they reveal to us the greater unified narrative of the texts. A narrative that's set around eternity and not bound by temporality. It's a narrative that we're invited into by the Holy Spirit. It's a revelation of the Spirit that the truth of Scripture, God's Word, is set within our hearts. And it's for this reason the biblical narrative is one of the greatest stories that's ever been told. Scripture reveals whose we are, who we are, and where it is we're going. It's a revelation of God and His relationship to us. We are God's image bearers. In the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, it says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on, earth, on the earth, and all of the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. There's this threshold moment for our protagonist. Right? There's the known, and then we approach the threshold. Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was one of the shrewdest of all wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any trees in the garden? Is this a familiar point? Yes. Nod. No. Yes. It's that threshold moment. That spiritual intervention. Continuing in Genesis 3, on verse 9, Then the Lord God called to man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. We've crossed the threshold. If we can put the, the, the hero's journey back up. We've crossed the threshold. We've gone from the known now into the unknown. The garden which God had created, which all things were good, now we've crossed over into new territory. As humanity rebelled, turning an ear to the seductive voice of the enemy, Adam and Eve's sin is the catalyst that made it essential for us to need a Savior. When we place ourselves at the center of the story, we see the failure of of Adam and Eve causing God's reaction. We see our shortcomings as problems we must rectify. We have no action. We have to take action so we can make those things right. The things that we've made wrong because now we're in the unknown. We've crossed over. It's by the revelation of the Spirit and the truth of Scripture that God's Word sets within our hearts that these things are revealed to us, that the revelation of Scripture presents the undeniable truth that we are sinners in need of a Savior. But when we place ourselves at the center of the story, we're unable to recognize the Savior. The Lord said to the serpent, I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. You see, we, we've crossed the threshold. Divine unity with God is what He's desired for His people since the very beginning. There was a plan in place to lead humanity into an intimate relationship with God, and 
there was a, always a plan for the Messiah. The one who's filled with transformative power. The one who invites us into eternity. The one who has been prophesied about since the beginning. The Lord God said, hostility, I will cause hostility between the serpent and the woman. I will bring your offspring between her offspring and your offspring and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. 1 John chapter 3, beginning on verse 7, Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. When we set our pride aside and recognize the primacy of Yahweh, we humble ourselves to the authority of the Almighty when we submit ourselves to the righteousness of His will and justice. We can begin to recognize the Savior that we've needed since the beginning. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. But praise God that through the revelation of Himself in Scripture, by way of the Spirit, He leads us to a different kind of Savior. He leads us to Himself. The prophecies within Scripture reveal to us the greater unified narrative of the texts. A narrative unbound and set free in eternity. A narrative that leads to Christ Jesus. It's a narrative that we are invited into. And the prophecies and the promises of God were written as an anchor point for God's people. And they're a revelation to us. Communicating whose we are, who we are, and where it is we're going. And we are God's people. So once the threshold is crossed, we enter into like the, the, the meat of the movie. Right? The, that threshold crossing typically is in that first 15 minute window where you're like, okay, I get the story now, and now we've hit the meat of the movie, the meat of the book, the challenges and temptations. Now, these come at length in Scripture. As you read through the Old Testament, you don't have to dig too far to start going challenge, temptation, challenge, temptation. Cain's murdering of Abel. Sarah's deception of Hagar, the rejection of Israel upon the approach of the promised land, the countless rebellions, really, of Israel as they wandered the desert. Challenge, temptation, challenge, temptation. But regardless of humanity's rejection and disobedience, God continued forward. The story moved on. Scripture is a revelation of God to us and His will for creation. Exodus chapter 12 reads, While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat to sacrifice. One animal from each household. And if the family is too small to eat the whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal according to size of each family and how they can eat it. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. Jumping forward to verse 11. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, and carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. I will see the blood and I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. The first Passover. The evening of death that led to the emancipation of God's people. Now God calls Moses to speak on his behalf. To reveal himself, not only to Pharaoh, but to the enslaved people of Israel. 
There's a duality in Moses' message. Because Moses speaks to Pharaoh himself. Pharaoh, the living embodiment of the Egyptian pantheon. The deity himself, Pharaoh. And the deification of Pharaoh essentially is a middle finger to Yahweh. Moses' message to Pharaoh was a call of humility. A call that wasn't heeded and it resulted in the crumbling of the spiritual enslavement of Egypt on the nation of Israel. Moses' message was to the people of Israel to repent, to return. You see, Israel had spent 430 years in enslavement. These 430 years had led to the rejection of God's authority. And it was an act of rebellion by God's chosen people as they began to submit themselves to the Egyptian gods. And they needed to be reminded of Yahweh's sovereignty. The blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. Moses spoke a message of repentance and return and it wasn't Moses who liberated and led Israel out of Egypt. Right? You've read the story or you're familiar, but remember, it wasn't Moses who liberated and led Israel out of Egypt. It was God working through him. With the sacrifice of the Lamb, God passed judgment and made a way for the people of Israel to leave the oppressive captivity and return to Him. There was a plan in place to lead humanity into an intimate relationship with God. There's always been a plan for the Messiah. Now there's a duality in the prophecy of the Lamb. The sacrifice was a, an act of man, an act of submission, an act of obedience. Out of this obedience, each family must select a one-year-old male, either sheep or goat, with no defects. The sacrifice of the flawless lamb is a handing over of immediate future stability. Security in a healthy flock. Financial safety, right? The best lamb fetches the best price. But under the, gra the grace, under the hand of God's judgment, was the real cost of the lamb. The sacrifice liberated the people of Israel. It made a way out of Egypt, and it made a way so Israel can live alongside God. Divine unity with Him is what God desired for His people since the beginning. There's always been a plan in place. There's a duality of the prophecy of the Lamb. The prophecy of the Lamb leads us to a different kind of Savior, one who's filled with transformative power, one who invites us into eternity, one who has been prophesied about since the beginning. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning on verse 13, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal Spirit, Christ Himself, Christ offered Himself to God as perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why He is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of sins, and they had committed under the first covenant. So through the challenges and trials, the prophecy of the Lamb leads us to a different kind of Savior. One who's filled with transformative power. Salvation is not a matter of our actions or what we have to offer God. Salvation is offered freely through the sinless life of Christ and His sacrifice on the cross as payment for our sins. We are sinners in need of a Savior. And God's will is to bring us into right relationship with Him. Psalm 40 begins by saying, I waited patiently on the Lord to help me. <clears throat> and He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what He has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Scripture is a tangible revelation of God 
who he is, what he wills, and how he operates. The Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. These prophecies and promises were written as an anchor point for God's people. Remind us whose we are, who we are, and where it is we are going. We are God's people. And we are people freed from the bonds of sin and death through Christ. Hebrews 10, beginning on verse 5, that is why when Christ came into the world, He said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you've given me a body to offer. You are not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in Scriptures. First Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels out the first covenant in order to put a second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. The Bible is an amazing unified story. It's a revelation of the living God written over a millennia and it leads us to Jesus. It's the greatest story ever told and yet it's one of the hardest ones to reckon with. As you start to dig into Scripture, it stirs within us this internal conflict. It's hard to get through Scripture Because to reckon with the truth revealed in Scripture is to reckon with the truth that we're not the main characters of the story. The Bible serves as a revelation of God to us, His imagers. We are not the driving force of the story. And we miss the point when we read the story placing ourselves at the center. Hebrews 2, beginning on verse 6. For in one place the Scriptures say, What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Or the Son of Man that you should care for Him? Yet while little, yet for a little while you made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them authority over all things. Now when it says all things, it means nothing is left out. That we have not seen all things put under their authority. What we do see is Jesus who for a little while was given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it, is, it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call him, call them his brothers and sisters. So we've reached the climax of our story. The abyss. The revelation. The transformation, the death and rebirth. Having gone through the trials and challenges that lead us to this point, all of the characters in our story they experience this reckoning moment. It's kind of the climax when the music fades away and you have to sit with the reality of everything that's happened. Kirstie and I had only been married almost two months when I graduated college, right? Two months. This is when adulthood is supposed to happen, right? Because you're not a student anymore. You're now a young adult. You're supposed to start living your life. You're supposed to get a job, get a house or an apartment, start a family. Having spent the last two months living off of just Kirstie's income because I was still in school, it was time for me to put that expensive degree to use and get a job. I was on the hunt. And of course, like most people, there was not a job in my area of study immediately where we were at. I had gotten my undergraduate degree in exercise science. Most people who get an exercise science degree go on to be physical therapists. But if you don't know, graduate school is very expensive. And to be a doctor, it's another four years. And I didn't want that. So I went into the job market and I ended up landing a part-time job at a gym here in town as a personal trainer. 
but it was a part-time job and it didn't really support the family. So doing the thing that a man should do in supporting his family, I proceeded to look for another job and I got another part-time job, landscaping. Now, the conflict between the two schedules really didn't provide either one of those jobs to support fully. So luckily for me, I was approached and offered a uh, coaching position at the high school. So now I've got more income coming in, which helps to provide for the family. And at its worst, my workday started at 4.15 a.m. and ended at 7.15 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And on Fridays, it started at 4.15 a.m. and ended at 10.30 p.m. Unless we were playing an away game, then, you know, bus travel. I also worked every other weekend, and it's not a very sustainable schedule. It kind of burns you out. But I had to do it because, you know, as we continued to live our life, we were living in a very tiny apartment. Um, Kirsty had a cat, uh, and so... There are three living things in this space, and cats smell bad. So we were looking for a house. In order to afford a house, you need like actual income to prove you can afford the house. So we had to keep going. I had to be able to provide for us. Because we're not starting a family in this tiny apartment, and we sure as heck can't have a family if we're both driving these two junky cars, so I gotta, I gotta keep grinding. I had to find a way to bring money into the home. I had to provide for her. I had to provide for us. I had to provide for me. It came to a point one night after Kirstie and I got into an argument, probably about money, that she looked at me and she said, Kyle, you're so caught up trying to provide for this family, have you ever stopped to think that maybe that's not your job? That one hurt a little bit, and then she went to work. <laughs> so we've reached the climax of our story. The abyss. The revelation. The transformation. Having gone through the trials and challenges that lead to this point, all of our characters, they come to a reckoning moment where going forward means that everything's changed. The hardest part to reckon with in our walk of discipleship is to accept the truth that we're not the center of the story. The piercing truth of Scripture, the blinding revelation of God in the text shows that we are not the main characters. We're not the providers. We are not the crusaders of truth. You are not the bringer of justice. You are not the Savior. The Bible serves as a revelation of our God to us, His imagers, that we are not the driving force of the story. And we miss the point when we place ourselves at the center. God's revelation made clear in Scripture by way of the Holy Spirit, it leads us to a different kind of Savior. The prophecy of the Lamb leads us to a different kind of Savior. The one who's filled with transformative power. The one who invites us into eternity. The one who has been prophesied about since the beginning. The one who frees us from the bondages of death. Going back to Psalm 40 on verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned to me, and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He had given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord, who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. O oh, oh Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all of your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. You take no delight in the sacrifices or in offerings. Now that you have made me listen, I finally understand you don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. Then I said, look, I have come as is written about me in your scriptures. I take joy in doing what your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. I have told all of your people about your justice. I have not been afraid to speak out as you, O Lord, well know, and I have not kept the good news of your justice hidden in my heart. 
I've walked, I've talked about your faithfulness and saving power. I've told everyone in the great assembly of your unfailing love and faithfulness. The Bible is a unified story written over a millennia, and it leads to Jesus. It's the greatest story ever told, and yet it's the hardest to reckon with because the truth of Scripture is to recognize we're not the main characters. The Bible serves as a revelation of God to us as imagers. Matthew verse 4 or Matthew chapter 4 verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth, then left there and moved to Capernaum, beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulunum and Naphtali. This fulfilled what God had said through the prophet Isaiah in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, beside the sea, beyond the Jordan River, in Galilee, where so many Gentiles live, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death cast its shadow, a light has shined. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to, return to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Scripture is a revelation. It's a revelation of the living God. It's a revelation of our Savior. Christ has returned from the abyss. If we want to put the journey back up. Christ has returned from the abyss. Jesus is the atonement. He's the redemption. He is the path that leads back to the known. Back to to the living unified with God. Divine unity with Him is what God desired for His people since the beginning. Divine unity was the plan and place to lead us into that intimate relationship with God. There's always been a plan for the Messiah, the one who's filled with transformative power, who invites us into eternity. 66 books written over centuries, and yet it's one unified story. The Bible leads us to Jesus. We as a people are drawn to story. Story drives us forward. It moves us. It keeps us going each day. The hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder, right? Fabulous forces are encountered. A decisive victory is won. This is the voice that lives in my head, so humor me. <laughs> the hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons upon his fellow man. We all love a good story. We love a good story where we can identify with the main character, where we can attach ourselves to that person and, and walk alongside them. The story of the Scripture is a revelation of the living God. It reveals the nature of our God. It reveals His character, His will, His intention for us. It's a story that we're invited into by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 4, on verse, beginning on verse 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of Gal the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come and follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. We love a good story. One where we walk alongside that main character. God is calling you to walk alongside him. As Christ had returned to bring us back into the known, back into that intimate relationship with God. He's bestowing that grace upon us to join Him in eternity. This morning as our final song plays, we're going to have a period of reflection. And I want to invite you to spend some time hearing that call in your heart because the foundations have been laid the story's been written. I want to invite you to answer the voice of God that's been speaking into your heart. 
Where are you trying to fill the role of Messiah? What bondage is preventing you from experiencing the freedom offered in Christ? Are you so caught up trying to provide for yourself, for your family, for those around you, that you haven't stopped to think maybe that's not your job? Scripture is a revelation of whose we are, who we are, and where it is we're going. We are God's people, created as imagers of Yahweh, a people freed from the bonds of sin and death, and we're walking towards eternity with our Savior. Heavenly Father, may your Spirit fall upon us this morning as we spend the next few minutes and reflective prayer, may your weight, may your glory rest heavy on our hearts. And may your hand break those chains that have held us down. Remind us whose we are. Remind us where we belong. And loosen our grip so we may embrace you in this moment. Amen. So as you go from this place, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.